Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back from lunch. I hope you're feeling refreshed and ready to, uh, to get involved in this afternoon's sessions. We have um, a great afternoon lined up, and to kick us off, I'm delighted to say that we're joined for a panel debate uh, by four superb panellists with very different perspectives from different parts of the world. This session is titled Models of Strategic Leadership Turning Ideas into Impact. And the idea of this session will be to, to try and get into the detail of how leadership plays an absolutely crucial role if universities are to deliver the sorts of impact that we're, we're talking about. And, and also, I hope to actually get to grips with what we mean by impact. Many of you will, will, will come from universities in, in parts of the world where impact over the last five years or so has become a really integral part of the conversation around higher education. The impact agenda, uh, which can relate to research, certainly, uh, governments and funding agencies expecting uh, academics to demonstrate the, the return on investment in research, whether that's in terms of economic outputs or social outputs or anything else. But I think impact can also relate to, 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 to students and certainly to graduates and the impact they have on societies. And impact, I'm sure, means very different things as well to university leaders, uh, to politicians, to taxpayers, and of course, to academics as well. So it's one of the really sort of hot topics, I think, in global higher education at the moment. And this is a great opportunity, as I, as I say, to pick up on global perspectives from four different parts of the world. I'll just introduce the panelists to you, and then we'll have some brief opening remarks from each of them before going into uh, panel discussion and debate. Uh, in order from my right, we have Alex Wei, who is Vice President for Research and Development here at Hong Kong Poly U. Next to Alex is Indu Shahani, who's founding dean of the Indian School of Management and Entrepreneurship. Uh, next to Indu, we have Tateo Aramoto, who is director of the Science, Technology and Innovation Policy Program at the National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies in Japan. And at the far end, Paul Fagan is vice president for strategic projects at Technion, the Israel Institute of Technology. So, as I say, a great, great panel, lots of different perspectives, and uh, we'll hear probably five minutes or so for each of them and then go into the discussion. So I'd like to pass over now to Alex. Thank you, John. And uh, giving me this uh, slight home court advantage, allow me to speak first. Um, ladies and gentlemen, hope you have good lunch. Um, in the next few minutes, I want to share with you uh, the, uh, the way that we do you know, innovations uh, and with impacts in uh, PolyU. PolyU is a university that recognized that with its uh, research output, they had wide applications and practical values uh, to the Hong Kong community, to China, and sometimes to the world. The motto of our university is to learn and to apply for the better of mankind. So the word apply is actually in our uh, spirit of our university. Um, our research uh, go from enhancing food safety, drug development, uh, enhance sustainability. Uh, we go to sky with uh, Boeing and also go to space uh, with the Russians, uh, European and the Chinese. In the next few minutes, I'll share with you examples. Okay, uh, use a few examples to share with you our philosophy how to do this whole thing. The underlying principle of all examples actually are the same. Um, you have to recognize opportunity when you see one. Uh, in fact, that's actually, that's not hard because changes bring opportunities. And the world has been changing very fast in the last 30 years. And we're in a part of the world that probably changes the fastest if you can you know, somehow uh, measure them. Idea and vision as a saying go is a dime a dozen, particularly in a university. We are not short of ideas. So the key point actually is in implementation, how to turn your idea into action. I remember once a professor told me what an innovation is. An innovative idea is that when you mention it, no one agrees with you. If they agree with you, then probably it's not innovative enough. And so when you have something that you think might work, okay, being innovative and visionary, uh, you don't expect consensus in the beginning. And here in university, professors are all critical thinkers. So naturally, they're very critical. And how to build teams, 
how to create win-win, we use the following strategies. The first one, clearly, is to encourage interdisciplinary research. Uh, we take advantage of our small campus. We get our professors together. As an example, we have uh, colleagues working on, you know, uh, uh, strike kites. This is a uh, uh, material for solar cells. And he, he last year broke the record of energy efficiency of 25%. And he did that with the help of someone from textile. A colleague, they actually the two run each other in a conference in Boston. And then that uh, colleague in textile, you know, uh, using bio-inspired you know, uh, uh, pattern, uh, actually rose petal. And, uh, so create a trap, if I may, okay, to, in, to increase light intensity that shine on the shoulder cell and therefore increase the, yeah, the efficiency. I suppose in the beginning, uh, at least I would not, never thought about you know, bringing you know, a material scientist and also a textile scientist together. Clearly, uh, you, you don't create impact from nothing. Okay? So uh, the important thing is build up from your own strength. So in you, we carefully look at what we are good at, what our professors are good at. For example, in communication, we have a good team in communications, and we use the fiber for sensors. And then we put our sensors in the railways. There we, we go from you know, communication to sensing, and then we, go, we have experts in structural health monitoring. We have experts in precision engineering, and so therefore we went into space, uh, precision molding machines, and also we have uh, microsurgery robots, same team, doing the, same, doing the whole thing. In chemistry and biology, okay, we bring the uh, technology together uh, to work on anti-cancer uh, drugs. The third, again, seeing an opportunity before anybody will see it, is the rise of China. I'll use our uh, involvement in the space project as example. Our story in space actually started in the 1990s, when our engineering experts started putting their you know, interest in, in space. Um, at that time, we actually started work with the, uh, uh, at that time, uh, sorry, Russia, okay. Um, it started from a, a dream, okay, of a dentist, bringing to his, co uh, his good friend, a professor in our university, you know, developing a, a hand tool for cosmonauts. After a uh, very uh, consistent effort working with the uh, uh, Russian teams, they, uh, in 1995, the cosmonauts, you know, the Mir space station, actually, you know, used uh, our technology. Then continue uh, with the Europeans, the Mars rock crawler. Uh, and unfortunately, the mission failed. Uh, it crash landed on Mars in 2003. And then uh, we also involved in the Russian project to the moon, Phobos of Mars. And unfortunately, that project also uh, not successful because the pro did not leave uh, Earth orbit. At that time, in 2005 or 6, the Chinese announced they want to go to the moon. At that time, not many people take it seriously. At the same time, uh, the Americans had gone to the moon. They put, they put a man on the moon back in the 60s. So what's, what's the big deal? In the university, we see it's a good way to bring a success close to home and also help the Chinese okay, in building up the space program. To make a long story short, we knock the doors, and it's not easy. We are not the only USD want to get involved in the Chinese space program. And eventually, uh, we convinced them. And in 2013, when the Chinese first soft land their uh, probe on, uh, on the moon, uh, we have a piece of our instruments on board. And as some of you have seen yesterday, uh, we are now involved in the uh, uh, mission uh, to be launched at the end of this year. Uh, achieve a sample from the moon. And the Chinese now are talking about going to, to, to Mars, and uh, we hope we can get involved in it too. Uh, quickly, I also want to bring up you know, another example. It's important to forge meaningful relationship with strategic partner. In this case, I want to mention Boeing. We've been working with local aviation MRO company for uh, 15 years. Uh, then someone pointed the opportunity to us that maybe we could set up a, a research center with Boeing. With eight, technical, uh, with eight visits all together, six technical visits, and then two on business side, after two years of negotiation, we finally able to work with Boeing. And then the uh, windfall is good. Uh, it brings us notice. No one realized that, you know, Paul, you can actually do aviation. And uh, able to bring 
work with strategic partners is a very important turning point for us. Finally, um, last thing we always try to do is try to develop the first of its kind of a technology that no one had done before. In this case, I want to point out our, our application of the optical fiber technology to railway. Um, again, uh, some of you have seen it yesterday. The key point is that we want to create so-called a smart railway system, a concept that we've been pushing and uh, we are getting uh, receptive ease. Uh, the good thing about optical fiber is that light is not affected by electricity. And uh, therefore, in the electric well in Hong Kong, you know, uh, optical fiber clearly has its own advantage. And we use the advantage that we have in our knowledge in optical fiber and apply to an area that no one had thought before. So uh, not to take a lot of time to conclude, um, you need to have a vision and you need to see opportunity. But the key point is that you need to be able to make it work. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Indu, should we hear from you next? Thank you. Good afternoon. I think every country faces very peculiar problems. And while uh, the earlier speakers just talked about the university system, I'm really going to take you off to our country to tell you a country, India, a country of 1.3 billion people. Uh, let's just begin with the ch challenges it has in higher education. Um, we have 62% of our population under the age of 30, 50% of our population under the age of 25. And currently, we have 305 million young people between the age of 15 and 28 years of age. 10 years from now, we will have 700 million people who will need higher education and who will need uh, colleges and schools. Currently, our gross enrollment ratio is just 24.5%. We need 1,000 more universities by 2020 to be able to reach even this up just by 10% more, higher it by 10% more. Um, this is really the, the context in which I want to say, what's the kind of leadership do you, do you really need in educational institutions when you have the youngest country in the world, when there are so many who are waiting and wanting higher education. Um, we've have, we have seen that India has produced some of the best um, postgraduate programs and the IITs and the IIMs, which is the Indian Institute of Technology, the Indian Institute of Management Studies have produced some of the best in the world. Today, if you look around in the US, uh, 17 of the, the best institutions in the world are headed by young Indians. Um, if you look around even the industry, Google, um, Google um, you look at uh, PepsiCo, all these are headed by young Indians. So the higher education system in India definitely has uh, made a difference, but I think the challenge is growing and the leadership style needs to now change. Having looked at this demographic uh, advantage and having seen that in the year 2020, if you look around the world, all the countries in the world will have a shortfall of human resources, including China, which would have a shortfall of 10 million human resources. India will be the only country in the world which will have a surplus of 47 million human resources which will mean either Indians will go to jobs elsewhere or jobs will come to them. So are we in India producing globally competitive young men and women? And having said that, um, the challenges that we now face are we need to have access, but we need to see that there is also quality. Um, institutional leadership, the way it now is being undertaken in most of the current frameworks, which is the government regulated institutions, because we follow the affiliating system of universities, where if I just had to give you an example of the University of Mumbai, which I have served for over three decades, we have um, 700, over 700 plus colleges which are affiliated just to one university, which means the colleges get one curriculum and you have over 350,000 students appearing for one examination. 
And so the challenge again is with your students becoming more and more dynamic, the youth today, if you look at the Indian young students, they are digital natives, and you can see that they are so technology savvy. Um, you have a business which is demanding, and you have, of course, the government who's focusing now and, and encouraging people to go ahead and try out new and different things. So talking about leadership in, in education, I would say that having been in three decades, not only just in leading institutions, but having been also a part of the University Grants Commission, which is the apex body which looks after all the universities in India, we realized that it was time for some disruptions. And the disruption was that you needed to, to, to make students more and more accepted to what was happening around them. And so therefore, um, we set up three new educational institutions which were based on our philosophy of DICE, which is design, innovation, creativity, and entrepreneurship. 25 million babies are born every year in India, and only a million jobs are being created. We need to now move away from a whole model where we were leading young um, job seekers from our universities to job creators. And how do we do that? Because there's not even an institution in India which teaches entrepreneurship. We were the first to set up the Indian School of Management and Entrepreneurship, and I think this will be the first time when something like this will be coming to the forefront. Having said that, we've also set up the first India's largest student-led accelerator. It's a 360-degree accelerator where the student enters, and I think the classrooms of the future are going to be incubators, because if, we, if India needs to move ahead and needs to produce these young entrepreneurs. Um, FinTech, EdTech, these are all the laboratories that we've set up, and, and I think the students are now actively involved in it. Our other philosophy is BEL, which is business and entrepreneurial-led learning. The entire curriculum, uh, we were very fortunate to work with Sir Martin Sorel and set up the WPP School of Communication, where it's the WPP school which gives us the entire curriculum. It's a work-study model, and we move towards producing young students who are employable. Um, it is sad to see that today the, the universities are still producing graduates who are not employable, and we need to skill them very quickly. We're happy to say that the Prime Minister is very keen on make in India, skill India, start up India. And we are moving ahead now to say, why not study in India? Why not create world-class institutions in India so that you can, you can be able to do everything that they would need to do if they were to go abroad to study? Um, so the entire model now needs to dis be, be disruptive, the, the leadership model. And I'm happy to see that while we are still a private, private organization, the government is now looking at bringing in 20 world-class institutions, creating them in India. And we might be one of those who might apply for this. But at the moment, I think the response that has come up from all the students, because it's a lot more led by students, it's a student learning model, uh, we can see that the entire the academic leadership model, the faculty training, the faculty, we are growing our faculty, we are having much more younger faculty, and just in under four years of the design school, under three years of the communication school, and, under, and just a year of the management and entrepreneurship school, we've been able to create, um, have breakthrough innovations from the existing system. That's very encouraging because that shows that the disruption has worked. Thank you. Thank you. It's always, uh, I think m many of us know the, the demographic figures, but fascinating to hear them. You know, 600 million people under the age of 25. It's really extraordinary. We're now going to hear from uh, Tatio and, and Aramoto on uh, a rather different part of the world with very different demographic challenges, of course, Japan. So, Tatio, over to you. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, 
Uh, my uh, talking point is the uh, three point. Is one is the uh, uh, Japan's perspective. The uh, we have the uh, around the uh, eighty national uni public universities across Japan, and the uh, in addition the uh, seven hundred uh, private university across Japan as well. So uh, uh, private universities the uh, reflecting the, uh, their own spirit, culture, and local uh, industries. But the, uh, these years, the uh, national public universities around the 80 universities the, uh, are taking a similar strategic policy and management style. But the, uh, 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 this, uh, since the, this morning, of course, the uh, uh, nature of the uh, university values and the uh, impact is rapidly changing globally, not only globally, but also the uh, nationally and the uh, locally. Then the, uh, particularly the, uh, uh, around the six years ago, you may remember the uh, Japan, the uh, uh, east north part, the uh, more than half the uh, very impacted uh, by the uh, big historic earthquake, tsunami, and the uh, Fukushima nuclear Accident. At that time, the, uh, even the, in the field of the uh, uh, academic field, activities, not only the uh, Japanese government uh, uh, science advice systems, nuclear safety as well, uh, in government, but also the outside university pe people, professors, and organizations couldn't take the appropriate advice and the actions to the uh, policy makers nationally and global, uh, uh, locally, but also the, uh, took the uh, appropriate actions, real action. Since that time, the uh, Japan's uh, university communities, policy makers, and the executive, the uh, uh, university president, and uh, rethinking, what is university? Why the uh, university is uh, so important under the changing world? So uh, now the uh, Japan's, uh, uh, my personal observation, I, I have been involved in uh, more than the, uh, 30 years the uh, Japan's uh, science and technology policy making and the uh, uh, implementation the, uh, as a governmental official. Now the, uh, I'm the university professor, anyway. So uh, uh, under such a situation, the uh, uh, collaborations uh, in between the uh, university executive and governmental sectors the, uh, to developing the uh, new programs. Uh, new program mean the, uh, since this morning, the, uh, normally, uh, straight was speaking, the, uh, most of the uh, uh, university promising the uh, student uh, certain, uh, my students were speaking, the uh, confined within their silo based upon the uh, traditional disciplines, physics, chemistry, biology. That is okay. Why? Because the, uh, these uh, 10 years, Japan, it's very happy for us, science communities, producing more than 10 Nobel Prize winners physics, chemistry, and the uh, physiology and medicine. It's very happy for us. But on another side, grand challenge type education and activities, we are lacking. So the, uh, coming back, the uh, Japan uh, uh, university communities recognized such a uh, uh, devastating situation after particularly the uh, March 11, 2011 uh, uh, Fukushima accident. So, uh, our policy is the, uh, supporting the uh, new challenging the, uh, uh, specific programs, Tokyo University and Kyoto University, nurturing uh, master course and the doctor course, the, uh, 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 educating the, uh, as uh, global leaders, global leaders. Not only the uh, uh, fundamental knowledge of the uh, uh, solid, physics and the chemistry, but also even they 
uh, they have the uh, uh, social literacy. Social literacy means the uh, uh, philosophy, ethics, history, and the uh, culture, and also their team building, and also their vision setting, and the, uh, of course the uh, need uh, balancing the uh, analysis and the uh, design thinking for the uh, tackle the uh, 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 grand challenges, for instance, uh, disaster prevention, the, and the et cetera, et cetera. So uh, coming back, the, uh, uh, our new program is the uh, Tokyo University under the leadership of the uh, new president, uh, Pro Professor Gono Kami, my friend, is the uh, uh, advanced reading graduate course for photon science. Another uh, imperial, old imperial college is Kyoto University set up graduate school of advanced integrated studies in human survivabilities. Those two uh, typical uh, examples is the, uh, as I mentioned, the uh, young promising uh, doctor course. Oh, no, no, sorry. Master course and the doctor course uh, street. And the, uh, those promising, uh, they pro uh, uh, program the accepting the promising young uh, student, their career, they want to go to the uh, research uh, community. Another uh, career path is the uh, going to the uh, governmental sector, not, not, not only the national, but also the uh, international organization. So uh, 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 again, the uh, combination, the, uh, of course, they need solid knowledge of traditional discipline, but also the, uh, they need uh, as I mentioned, the uh, social uh, literacy or the uh, knowledge of the uh, social innovation. So coming back to the, in Japan, I, I stopped the, uh, uh, this time is the uh, Japan's. Uh, these uh, 50 years, uh, at the stage of the uh, industrialization of Japan, at the initial phase, 50 years ago, Japan, we facing the devastating situation, contamination, air, water, and the uh, land management. Since that time, the uh, Japan's effort in combinations, industry, and local government, and universities come together to tackle those uh, devastating situations, Kyushu area, Tokyo, and the northern part of the Tohoku. Those, therefore, the, now the, uh, we get the uh, uh, clean uh, conditions uh, socially and the, uh, uh, um, the industrially uh, under the, uh, 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 keeping the uh, industrial activities. Why? Those activities, of course, the, uh, we need high technologies, em environmental technologies, physics, chemistry, but also the, uh, uh, we need it local needs or the local character of the, uh, each uh, area, impacted areas, history, and the social systems, and the political system. So the, uh, uh, based upon the, uh, such uh, uh, experiences and the knowledge, so the, uh, we, again, the recognize university for not only the, for creating new knowledge, but also the university for social Barriers in the local areas, local, locally, and the nationally, and the uh, uh, globally. That's my first Great. remark. Thank you. So, sorry, thank you very much. <clears throat> now, uh, just before we get to the discussion, we'll hear from, from Paul Fagan, who uh, will have a perspective from a, a very renowned public research university, Technion in Israel. Paul. Thank you very much. I'm uh, a repeat visitor to PolyU and to the Icon Hotel. I feel very much at home here among friends. So, but again, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, I took the title rather literally, talking about strategic leadership and uh, turning ideas into impact. And I think the first message that's at least relevant in the context that I come from is that in order to convert ideas to impact, you need money. And uh, that basically 
defines the role of our president in, in our system. First of all, he has to convince the professors that uh, his ideas or the management's ideas are the things that we should follow. But then he has to go out and get the funds to make it happen. And I'll give you some examples as we, uh, uh, as we go on. Unfortunately, the situation in Israel is that our central government isn't very forthcoming in providing funds to the university for development, and, uh, and therefore we rely on, uh, in, you know, to a large extent, on philanthropy. So what is impact in higher education? I like to think of higher education as having three main roles, uh, education, research, creating of knowledge, and uh, the third one, innovation. And when you want to measure impact, then the natural thing to do is to measure the outcomes of education, research, and uh, innovation. Measuring the outcome in terms of education um, can be done by student surveys during, uh, during their studies, but I think what we are missing is evaluating their uh, the student satisfaction after they've left the university. And uh, it's something that's, of course, more challenging uh, to measure. Uh, there are attempts, of course, looking at salaries as a, as a proxy for satisfaction of, uh, of your, with your education. Uh, just going back to the teaching side, I mean, when you ask our, our students during their four years, the rather intensive program, what they think of the teachers, they're mixed, there's a mixed response. When you ask them 10 years or five years out of, out of their studies, um, there's a much, maybe they forget the hard parts, but uh, there's a much more positive feeling about that they have learned something that's useful in their careers. The other measure of uh, uh, outcome in terms of innovation is something that I wanted to suggest uh, uh, to the Times Higher Education people is uh, measuring the impact of our graduates in the, on the economy. Now, it's not easy. Uh, and we, and MIT, for example, have, have done a survey of their graduates a few years ago, and we did something similar, and we discovered that 25% of our graduates have either started a new company or are leading a startup company. So that's something that reflects on their education, on our influence on innovation. I'll come back to that in, in one minute. I only have a few points. I don't want to take too much time. Um, so when we talk about strategic de decisions, uh, they are decisions the university makes on education, on research, and on innovation. So to promote education, for example, we have uh, put a lot of uh, uh, effort on emphasizing quality of teaching. How do you do that? One is to offer a prize for good teachers. Again, you need some money. You need to, someone to uh, endow a prize. You can encourage faculty to use new novel teaching methods, and we've heard before about flipped classrooms and, uh, and using of uh, uh, MOOCs and so on. I won't go on with that. Uh, into, into, I won't go into that, uh, except to say that, again, it needs money. To train professors to use new methodology to set up MOOCs is not a cheap uh, exercise. Uh, and our friends from Nanyang Technological University can uh, vouch for that, because I remember how much money they're spending on their uh, program. Um, to promote research, one of the ways of increasing research output is to bring in more graduate students and more postdocs. Again, costs money. Um, We've also tried to direct our basic research into interdisciplinary research, as we heard a lot of people mention today. And how do you do that? You set up centers that are funded uh, across the different disciplines. We've been very successful with those in nanotechnology, in energy, and so on. Um, to, promote, to promote innovation, uh, One way is to set up facilities on the campus that encourage faculty to commercialize their, uh, 
their research output. Uh, and you have a certain resistance to overcome because the traditional model of uh, disseminating knowledge is by publishing papers. Uh, how do you convince faculty that if you really want to dissemin disseminate the knowledge in a way that will be useful to the society, you have to first patent it? Because if you don't patent it, nobody will invest in it to make it into a product, and therefore your knowledge that you've created becomes uh, un, uh, doesn't get access to the, uh, to the market. So it's, a, it's like a twisted thinking. One, one thinks that if you publish it, that everyone can use it. The truth is, if you publish it, nobody wants to use it because they don't want to invest in it. Uh, and, uh, and so you have to go through a process of convincing your faculty that this is, a, another, way, this is another way to disseminate their knowledge uh, and encourage innovation. Um, of course, there's also the innovation that the students come and when people come to the Technion and, and say, you have this wonderful record of commercialization of technology transfer, and we, I at least, and many of my colleagues will say repeatedly, if you want to look at scale of innovation, it's our graduates that make the impact on the economy. It's not the professors, for all the good work they do and all the, the discoveries, that is not the main impact of our university on the, on the economy. Um, I want to talk about one other strategic decision that was uh, raised earlier this morning also, and that's uh, the, no the idea of globalization. Uh, first of all, in, often when you have a strategic decision, you think that it's a decision that you made a priori and you've decided to achieve something. There is another, uh, and many people who work in, talk about startups and so on, talk about the, the serendipity angle, uh, or the luck that you have to make a successful uh, startup. Um, I look at it slightly different. I think that, yes, there is a, a luck involved, but you have to be able to, to exploit the opportunity. Something comes up. You make a decision that it's in line with your overall goals and you go ahead and do it. And um, for example, with the Technion, we had an opportunity to compete for a setting up an applied research institute in New York City. Sort of a pipe dream, you know, who, why, would the, why would we uh, enter a competition? What chances do we have? And in the end, we partnered with Cornell and we won the competition. And we are now moving in July to the Roosevelt Island campus of the Technion Cornell Institute. Another opportunity arose when the Lee Ka Shing Foundation came to us and asked us to help them establish a new campus in Shantou University. Again, an opportunity, a challenge, and uh, the Tecton took this on. Uh, and when you ask the, f the faculty, why are we doing this? They will, uh, well, they'll ask the management often to say, why are you doing this? Why are you directing your attention to setting up a campus in New York or setting up a campus in, in China? Um, and that's where the vision of the management of the president has to be uh, uh, explicit and has to be clear. Um, I don't, in our universities, it's not enough for the president to say uh, he wants to do it, has to go to the Senate, the Senate has to be convinced, it has to vote. Um, but, uh, and we rely on those few professors who are visionary enough and who understand that in order for the university to succeed in, in today's world, it needs to, and this was said, said also this morning, it needs to establish its reputation. With a good reputation, you will get good faculty. With good faculty and good reputation, you'll get good students, and then you'll have better outcomes. So it's, it's sometimes a little bit hard to see uh, beyond uh, what are the immediate interests of the faculty member, uh, and that's the job of strategic leadership, to be able to think about what's going to happen in 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And let me just finish by saying that um, we have to be a little bit wary of when we try to measure innovation and working with industry, uh, that we're not turning the university into a organization that provides services to industry, and that's our contribution to innovation. 
we have to allow for the what I call blue sky research to go on, that this aspect of uh, higher education is the innovation of the next 15 and 20 years. If you don't have that base, after solving the problems of the current industry, uh, you'll find that in five or 10 years, you'll be stuck for new ideas. So strategic leadership involves trying to balance between the different pressures to uh, advanced university. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. And thanks to all the panel. We have uh, <coughs> at least 20 or 25 minutes now for, for conversation, and I'd like to come and bring in the audience as well. But maybe we could just, just start by picking up perhaps that, that final point you were making, Paul, a point that sort of ran throughout your, your opening remarks about money. I've never met a university president that didn't say they needed more money. It's, <laughs> it's, it's par for the course. But um, money comes with strings, doesn't it? And, uh, and increasingly, those strings relate to a return on investment and a demonstration of impact. It's being made explicit in funding agency uh, regulations around the world. It's being made uh, implicit, at least, in, the, in, in the, the, the contract that exists between universities and the taxpayer, where, where systems are supported by the state, and also by uh, the, the relationship between the university and, and students, who increasingly pay quite high fees in many countries to study. So, there is this, this constant demand from the, the paymasters, if you like, the people who are actually paying the faculty's salaries to, to demand impact, sometimes impact that's actually even forecast in advance. Now, that's a real challenge for, for academics, isn't it, in the traditional sense of academics who are going out to further knowledge, you know, to pursue lines of inquiry just for their own sake, and that sort of serendipitous blue skies idea that has always underpinned the research university and, and, and you know, tends to be the research that produces... Nobel Prizes and so on and so forth. I know you have three Nobel laureates at Technion. I mean, maybe we could just pick up on that. I don't know if you wanted to elaborate, Paul, or, or anybody else wants to get in here, on that, that fundamental tension. Are we in a place now where there is too much of a demand for impact on academics? Is it actually starting to impinge on the effectiveness of the academic process, or are we not quite there yet? Um, do you want to...? Okay. Yeah? So, okay, sorry. So uh, uh, in Japan, the, uh, we have the uh, uh, structure of the budget to go into the uh, 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 university, yes, portion, uh, fundamental science, blue sky. Another portion is the application or innovation. How to keep the balance, those uh, structures of budget, is very, very important. But the, uh, under the... Uh, Current situation is the uh, portion is the uh, <laughs> uh, waiting uh, innovation, and the, uh, th therefore the uh, how to rebalance uh, such structure is very very important. Therefore, the uh, uh, we pay attention the uh, not only the uh, supporting from the public sector public funding mechanism, but also the uh, we need. Uh, uh, collaboration, the uh, private companies, mm -hmm. private companies, a lot of money. Then the, uh, uh, we are preparing the, uh, uh, developing the uh, public-private partner, new public-private partnership. For instance, the uh, Japan's multi uh, companies, national companies, Hitachi and the Mitsubishi trading uh, companies. The uh, now the. Uh, 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 institutionally, the uh, collaboration with the uh, individual, Tokyo University and some universities, the, uh, what, what field is there for, for instance, sustainability? Sustainability, of course, the uh, issue driven application. But uh, within their uh, areas, is the uh, uh, university side is the, uh, developing the new knowledge frontiers. I mean the management of the marine uh, migration, etc., etc., et So I stress again, the, uh, uh, we need uh, a combination, public money and the uh, private money. I suppose to my, keep, my, yeah. the, the, the point I'd pick up on that, yeah. <clears throat> someone earlier said that vice chancellors, university presidents are not CEOs. They cannot become mm -hmm. chief Sorry. executives. <laughs> Your role is fundamentally different. There is a role for, for strategic leaders and institutions to protect academic freedom and academic autonomy yeah. and all those things. Is that a crucial part of the role? I mean, should we come to you, Alex, and then? Yeah, sure. Yeah, well, uh, 
the, the point is clear. Uh, no, nobody's arguing the extreme, right? Everybody, every person is allowed to do whatever they want to do, or that we have deliverable for every piece of research. So as the former speaker said, balance is a key issue. Uh, we need, you know, the politician, the government to understand that, you know, there are room for, you know, curiosity uh, in spite of research. But at the same time, we academics cannot say that, well, we are in the ivory tower, we do what we want to do, and uh, you give me taxpayer money, and my work may or may not be beneficial to society, particularly we have so much problem we are facing. Climate change bringing a whole set of challenges to society. Mm. And the new technology, you know, the internet, you know, AlphaGo, AI, are changing the way that the whole, whole job is, right? Their, their prediction from Oxfox that 60% of the job will be gone in 15 years. So we in the university do have a clear social responsibility to able to educate our students, prepare them you know, for a future that we don't know. Mm. So uh, the, the point is where the balance is, and that balance depends on the resources of that society. Yeah, I mean, do you agree, Paul? Is it no longer acceptable for an academic in some esoteric corner of physics to say, I'm just doing this because it's interesting, because I think there may be something there and there may not be. Is that no longer, are we no longer there as far as academia is concerned? Well, I, I hope very much that, we're, that it is legitimate for the academic to, uh, to do esoteric research. It, and there are measures of that. I mean, he publishes it if it gets published in good journals and there's a high impact factor and a lot of people cite him. That's evidence that it's, it's interesting to, to a community. There are, of course, examples where you know, people have gone into very narrow areas and, and, uh, and there's sort of very closed community that support each other. And I mean, there are, you can, there are those examples. But uh, I think as a rule, we have to pay that price. Uh, and I think it, it sort of comes back to what I said about reputation. If the university has a good reputation because of its a global exposure, because of its acceptance, then society, despite all these uh, requests for impact, immediate impact, I think they understand that. Yeah. I think that universities still, at least in the environment that I'm working in still have a sort of prestige value that, that people are, understand that it's important that we have universities. Yeah. Can I come to you, Indu? This is obviously about models of strategic leadership and, and different models may apply in different contexts. You gave a very uh, <coughs> clear um, setting out of the, the, the situation in India with the demographics and the 25 million babies born every year and 1 million jobs created. I mean, it's really extraordinary numbers, quite, quite scary if you, if you stop to think about them. Mm -hmm. Um, does that require a fundamentally different model of strategic leadership from a higher education perspective than perhaps, uh, you know, some of the, the more developed systems that we talk about? And, and if so, you know, is there a need for some really disruptive, brave leadership, possibly involving tech businesses too, to try and massively ramp up the scale and the mode of delivery of higher education in, in the Indian context? And is that happening? Um, it's starting to happen, and uh, I'm happy to say that uh, the government is also recognizing it. But I'm just going to take off from where he was talking about funding. Um, it's so different in every country, right. and it's yeah. interesting to see yeah. that in India, higher education is highly subsidized by the government. True. All the grants, the research grants, everything comes from the government. The university presidents are never seen going out and seeking money mm -hmm. because everything comes from the government. Mm -hmm. They're only complaining that the grants haven't come in, but it is, they're not actually proactively going out and, and getting that money. But I think that's going to change because now the government is sending in, it, it ha is putting in a lot more money for innovative projects, for universities that are coming out with, with breakthrough research. And if they need those grants, then they have to produce that kind of research. So that's, that's very encouraging. Um, leadership and strategic leadership model, yes, I think we need to, as I said, completely disrupt. For 25 years, I was just looking at the government grants. I was a glorified head clerk who was only receiving regulatory notes from the university. And now that I have to run my own institutions, 
I have to see that the students must get what they want because a large amount of this depends on the students wanting to come to the institution. I think we are more entrepreneurial in our, in our approach. Uh, we are more innovative in our approach. We're bringing in new methods of teaching and learning. We're bringing in uh, um, younger people to come in here. We're bringing in different models of corporate connect. And I think one of the things we've done very differently is to move the campus into a corporate building, which has 109 corporates around it. And hopefully, the students, after they finish, just make an elevator pitch, go to any of those <laughs> corporates, and get the jobs. But, but that's if they want the jobs, um, because we're hoping to create more entrepreneurs. So having said that, we want to use our city as the um, laboratory, we want to use our country as the laboratory, and I think when you talk about impact, I would talk here about the social impact. We want social innovation. We want young India to understand its challenges and bring in solutions for these challenges. Mm. I'd like to come on to the impact of your students and graduates shortly, but before I do, we've talked about money and funding, and then we'll come to students, but in the middle are the faculty. and. Um, it occurs to me, that someone mentioned earlier, that I think the phrase was the inertia of faculty. Right. And there's the, the old joke about, you know, changing university, the direction of university is like changing the location of a graveyard in that you're not going to get much help from the, the inhabitants. <laughs> and there is something in that, I think. You know, faculty are very resistant to change, very resistant to, to some of these, you know, new novel ideas, and probably resistant to strategic leadership to a certain extent. You know, they, they like to do things the way that they've always been done. I wonder if any of you have any perspectives on that, how, how leaders can actually bring a faculty with them into a radically new place, if that's where we need to go, without sort of, you know, completely alienating the faculty and then probably so, losing your job, because if you lose your faculty, so you tend I'm to lose your job. I'm going to this uh, to say that uh, if, you're, if you're a college which is completely, or a university which is completely subsidized by the government, the government pays, pays the faculty uh, salaries. The salaries come from the government. And there's complete tenure from the moment you join the university. It, the professor gets the salary, and it gets uh, you know, credited to the bank account of the faculty member without even the college knowing about it. Can you imagine the security the faculty have? Why should they come to college, and why should they teach? So how do you bring in a leadership model in this state? I, I always challenged my corporate friends to say that you have measurable targets. You, you are able to motivate them because you have incentives. How do I motivate faculty who know they're going to get their salaries whether they perform or not? Pay is not linked to performance. It, there's no excitement about it. And I think that's where the challenge came up for me as a young principal of a leading college to say, what is it that excites? And I started working on touch points. What is it that excites every faculty? And looking at that, we started doing different things which really excited them. And it was very difficult. But I must say, once you bring in this co competition within each of them, and we bring in the collaborative spirit I think things really can work and things can do. Yeah. Alex? Well, I, I can supplement uh, what Indu said, uh, with example in Poru. Uh, I mentioned earlier about the uh, railway monitoring projects. Uh, the professor do very well, uh, bigger German pace here. Uh, they work in the local metro system, they're happy. Uh, then the, the problem in Hong Kong is that the fastest, very small city, the, the fastest train went only 130 kilometers per hour. And the Chinese at that time are talking about, you know, uh, at that point, you know, they're running their uh, high-speed rail 400 kilometers per hour. So I challenged the professor to say that, well, why don't we try working in China? Uh, they get excited. We go into it. But that's just the beginning. Then we, I had to bring civil engineers, you know, because most of the high-speed rails are actually on high, high bridges. And then also the uh, electrical engineers go do the, uh, put the fiber sensor there. And soon there's this disagreement on what they want to do, you know, what should be done. Cultural difference between Hong Kong and China uh, is not an easy task. But I think, uh, as Indu pointed out, get something that you know the in, uh, the academics, they are all uh, intellectuals, something that excite about, something that aspire to. 
a platform that they cannot get, you know, in their own comfort zone in Hong Kong, so only 130 km an hour. That's a way to get them move. And then, but as I said, it's only the beginning. Afterwards, you know, there's still a lot of details you to work out. Okay, coming back to the uh, money. But uh, we need not only money, but also the management of university is important. Therefore, the, uh, in Japan, yeah, just uh, last year, uh, we started in collaboration the uh, Ministry of Education and Science and the uh, Association of the uh, uh, National Universities. Uh, we started the uh, new programs to uh, nurture in the uh, uh, top management uh, faculty, future candidate of the future provost and the university president. Because the, uh, so far, uh, Japan is the uh, president uh, selected and assigned based upon he or her own uh, research accompli accompli accomplishment. Now, no. How to meet the uh, uh, global challenging uh, age? Yeah. But uh, 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 my personal idea, that uh, program that should be um, uh, designed and managed university network, not <laughs> control the government, <laughs> but uh, now the uh, uh, collaboration, yes, uh, collaborative the uh, program, the uh, probably the uh, last in the uh, three years. So the uh, we uh, now the last year the uh, 25 uh, promising the faculty uh, around the uh, 45 or 50 the uh, future provost and the uh, coming to, coming to in Tokyo and the uh, they send uh, we send the, uh, them to the uh, uh, UC San Diego and Chicago etc. Et also the uh, we invite in the for instance the president of the National University of Singapore the uh, Dr. Tan. So the exchange Yeah, I mean that's it's interesting because that <clears throat> the, the the perception of the Japanese system is it's been quite closed and quite quite yeah. inward looking, yeah. but that's changing. I suppose you have the opposite demographic issue that that Indu is facing in India, in that you have uh, a very aging population, not so many yeah. young people coming through yeah. to university, yeah. and you're being forced to perhaps mm -hmm. look out yeah. of Japan <laughs> and see what else is. <laughs> yeah, so uh, it's very uh, serious uh, situation in Japan. The uh, we are facing the uh, the aging societies. So the, uh, uh, in order to keep the uh, uh, research and education activities, we need uh, inviting the more promising uh, faculty members, not only faculty members, but also the uh, students. Mm. So the uh, uh, big university, Tokyo and Kyoto, and they also the, uh, uh, now the uh, 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 ratio of the uh, uh, population, the uh, uh, student abroad is the, uh, only the 15% uh, around there. Mm. But in, in my university, it's very unique. Uh, gra uh, graduate Institute for Policy Studies, only the, uh, we have the 400 uh, 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 student, uh, graduate student, more than the uh, two thirds from abroad many the developing countries, policy, science, and management. Uh, we, we can uh, uh, show the uh, uh, models to the uh, uh, Japanese the, uh, university uh, executives. Thank you. Let me, we have 10 minutes left, so let me see if anyone in the room wants to come in. Are there any, any questions? Timothy Tong, down at the front. There's a mic just coming. Thank you. Uh, am I on? You're okay, on. Yeah. okay, thank you. Well, I just want to uh, chime in on a couple of points that were covered earlier. And John, in particular, you asked a question about whether it's okay to have an academician to say, don't bother me, I just want to focus mm. on doing my blue sky research. Mm. I think it's perfectly okay. <laughs> it's just that within the same department or within the same college, you cannot have everybody to behave that way, mm. okay? Mm -hmm. If you have a department, physics, uh, consisting of 20 professors. If one or two or even three or four of them is like that, doing basic research, but doing excellent basic research, I think it's perfectly okay. You just need to also have a handful of people who are more inclined to get involved in doing the translational work, to get the results on the basic research into practical use. 
As a matter of fact, as a university, we pride ourselves uh, on the fact that we, so many of our staff gets involved in knowledge transfer. Mm. But still, the truth is the majority of our staff are not involved in that endeavor, mm. okay? But that's okay. We don't need all of our staff to be doing the same thing. We just need enough of them. And also, those who have the potential to contribute, we just need to make sure that we have the opportunity for them to get involved as well. Mm. You know, so yeah. thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'm sure that's a very similar model. I mean, at Technion, you, you, you have a strong, very strong track record of, of Blue Skies research, but also you are operating in areas that have very practical applications. So presumably you operate in a similar way. Very, very similar way. Very similar way. Just going back to the point about um, faculty inertia. Uh, again, it's an opportunity, it's, it's exploitation of opportunity. In the last uh, 10 years, 50% of our faculty have turned over. We have a large cohort of young faculty that you can work with in a different way than the, and we have a you know, compulsory retirement age of 68, which is quite generous, but also very important. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and this, this allows us to renew in, uh, our teaching methods as well as, of course, bring new research topics to, to the fall. Yeah. Let me come on to the question of, of your graduates and your students. Um, when we talk about impact, very often we focus on research, but, but I think one of you, was it Paul, said that the, the biggest impact you have is through your through your graduates, through your students, through the, the things that they go on to do when they leave your university. Is that something that, that could and should be measured, do you think? Should there be some accrual of credit to you as institutions or as institutional leaders that you are actually having this impact on your university? And if so, how would we go about measuring that? Or is it just impossible? Is anyone any, any strong views on that? Well, I, I have a strong view that, that one should measure it. I mean, we did that with our own graduates. We actually surveyed all our graduates in the last uh, 20 years. I mean, we have lists of and, uh, and asked, found out what they were doing and, and what they're involved in. And we could actually convert that into a into a investment figure. I mean, what is the number of jobs that they created? What is the uh, impact on the on the, how much was invested in their companies? What is the output? Um, it's it means. Uh, and I, you know, as you sur I think you, you were saying that uh, you, you actually have some surveys of, of students, of graduates. Uh, you, know, you can ask them more questions about that are related to the way they're impacting the economy or the society. Mm. Yeah. But what, what credit would you like to sort of accrue to you? Is it purely reputational? Is it purely the, the knowledge that, that other students will want to come and study with you because they see how well others have done? Or do you think there should be some mechanism for actually <clears throat> tying funding, for example, to those sorts of outcomes. Is that something that, that any of you would support? Or should we come to you yeah. in doing? So, you know, uh, it's also what you're passionate about. And I think I've been very passionate about the social innovation and social impact. And one of the things I did, a small exercise I did in, in the college, I had 7,000 students. And this is just one institution, so it had 7,000 students. And they all give this one university exam at the end of the year, and they pass the examination. And then the certification comes from the university, and the only role I play is in handing over that certificate, which comes from the University of Mumbai. And I thought that I could, I could do something very disruptive here. I made it mandatory for every student in my three-year undergraduate program to at least once do a project with a nonprofit or, or a non-government organization or a social organization. And then the faculty, there was a big UN crowd at the faculty and they said, oh, but it's so easy to get a certificate from a blind school or from a deaf and dumb school and so on because they'll be able to go there and spend some time and get you a certificate. I said, but even if it touches one heart out of the 7,000, it'll matter. And I have to tell you that one of the young men who actually did this was actually a very successful uh, investment banker, left everything to start India's first career company, but which employs only the deaf. Mm. And just won the President's Award for that. And I have to say very proudly that today the college has produced the largest number of social entrepreneurs. Mm. Yep, so, so it's, it's something great. that I felt that was the impact we yeah. wanted to yeah, make. It's a great story, Alex. Well, um, 
clearly, I mean, uh, Eurasia State Education uh, Institutions, they are most important impact uh, the students that we, we educate. And but there's a peak four about measurement, okay? The cliche about uh, those, uh, the most kind of accountable. Uh, economic impact is important, job creation is important, but we educate social responsible citizens, citizens with values. I think that's more important. In Poro U, uh, uh, we introduced you know, service learning. And the whole idea is to try to, through uh, critical bearing subjects, you know, get our students into society, work with using their uh, discipline knowledge to help you know, the community. Hopefully, and we have seen evidence for that, that our students, when they graduate, they know, you know that uh, they are not here to take advantage of the resources of society rather than give it back. And that, well, we are coming with measures to, to, to study the, uh, the impact you know, of the, the, these subjects. But uh, uh, quantifiable, you know, being a scientist, engineer, uh, I am afraid the margin of error could be very high. Mm. Well, look, just to bring it back to the, you're all being incredibly uh, uh, selfless in your disc description of you know, social justice being the most important thing and so on. Of course, the US uh, experience is as well that if you create entrepreneurs that go on to become billionaires, some of them will actually come back and, and be philanthropists that give back to their alma mater too. So hopefully some of, it, some of the money flows back to you that way as well. Um, we're coming to the end of the, the session. Uh, I, I got slightly carried away with my own questions and didn't take many from the audience. If anyone's <laughs> desperate, let's have one question from Aaron at the front here and then we'll, we'll, we'll bring the, uh, the session to a conclusion. I just want to pick up on the issue of that human capital is the most important contribution that universities make to the, the innovation ecosystem. Um, and I think we need to do more of the survey that, uh, that you were talking about and what MIT and Stanford has been doing. But it doesn't have to be limited to just founders of companies. It also has to be limited to leaders in companies, people who are leading social enterprises, and I think QT is trying to do something based on the MIT and Stanford survey. I'll pick, pick on that. But you asked the question, what is it going to benefit other than universities feeling good about it? Uh, I think we shouldn't fool ourselves. Whether we are private or public universities, we all depend on the public purse. Most of our research is funded by taxpayers' money. We shouldn't fool ourselves. When we demonstrate that we are having this impact and we can value this impact, we make a case for future funding. And I think that is the most important thing that we do by demonstrating that we are engines of economic drive mm. uh, for the communities in which we belong. And I think we shouldn't forget that. Uh, and that's the most important thing that we have to do, those surveys. Yeah, I think a really important point to finish on, actually, because as we know around the world, uh, universities are starting to at least appear to lose some of the political capital that they've, they've held uh, in, in previous times. So we're, we're out of time, unfortunately. I'll just do a, a one plug for a session that's happening at breakfast tomorrow. If anybody wants to come and talk about the, the issues of human capital and academic talent, uh, we will be holding a session with, uh, with colleagues on THE, including some exclusive data from one of my colleagues on the data team, which will be happening between 7.30 and 8.30 tomorrow about recruiting academic talent. So do talk to THE colleagues on the stand outside if you'd like more information about that and you'd like to, to come along. But uh, other than that, just uh, join me in thanking the panel for a really interesting discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.